Well, good morning, everyone. This is Father Brett here at St. Genevieve, and welcome to this fifth session now of To Know and to Love, where we come to grow in our knowledge of our faith and of our Lord in order that we can more deeply fall in love with Him. I invite you to this day on this beautiful Tuesday. Uh, we're going to be switching it up a bit, as you may have seen from Father Eric's uh, update last week. I believe that now on Tuesdays we're going to be having these videos. Hope you've had a blessed week. I know we didn't, I didn't get to speak to you all last week. I took a little time off to prepare more for the upcoming month. We've got a lot in store for you um, in the month of May. Because as you know, the month of May is the month of Mary. And so we're preparing a lot of sources so we can get in touch more with our Marian devotion and with Our Lady. Um, if you excuse me for one moment, I just want to check one thing before we begin. Yes. So, with that, we begin this session. And as I mentioned, excuse me, a little too much coffee this morning. That's all right. So, this next coming month is the month of May, and traditionally in the church, we call it the month of Our Lady, and we honor Our Lady in many different ways. We have the May crownings, which are normal. We have different Marian feast days that fall within the month of May, especially at the end of the month, we end with the feast day of the visitation. But maybe before we even get into the month, a question may come up in our minds that has been maybe directed at us a lot. It's a question, why is it that we hold Mary in such high honor? And I've talked about this in homilies. You know, many priests have discussed this. You've probably discussed this on different websites, like apologetics websites and such. What is it about Mary? What is it about the saints? And why do we Catholics regard them so? And specifically, maybe the question that's posed to us Catholics most often, especially by our Protestant brothers and sisters, is do you worship Mary and the saints? And that's a very important question. I think as we go into this time where we honor Our Lady in a special way, it may be important for us to sit back and to reflect on what is it that we give to Our Lady? What is it that we what is the kind of honor we give to the saints, and how is it different than what we give to God the Almighty? How is it different than the honor that we give to the Trinity? Because I think it's important that we not only understand that so that we can, you know, when we're questioned about it, that we can give a good answer. You know, as St. Peter says, to always have, and I'm going to paraphrase this badly, but to always be prepared to give a defense for your hope and for your, your faith. He says that in one of his letters. But also, I think it's important for us to remember the kind of honor we give to the saints and to Our Lady in order that we can keep the perspective, in order that we can, you know, honor them the way that they're supposed to and give them, you know, not give them too little. But also, I think something important to remember is not to, not to overdo it. I think that's something that in our days and every day of the church in the church's history has been uh, something always keeping the balance. We're a church of balance. We're a church of always remembering not to go into extremes, except as I think C.S. Lewis puts it best in one of his writings. He says to only the only extreme that's really necessary is the extreme of devotion to our Lord. And so, let's wrap our heads around what is it that we give to Our Lady and to the saints as far as we talk about, you know, prayer and veneration. And I'm going to use some fancy terms with you during this session. You know, I've been thinking a lot, like, maybe of diving deep into some more theology with y'all, and I'm going to... Describe how we consider Mary and the saints using a few, a couple terms 
that you may or may not have heard of before that we use in theology. And these are terms that we talk about when we talk about the veneration that we give to holy, holy people and holy things called latria, L-A-T-R-I-A, latria, and dulia, D-U-L-I-A. And then the third term is kind of a compound word, hyperdulia. It's just the word dulia with hyper in front of it. So I'm going to talk about these things because these give us the idea of how we regard the saints different than how we honor the Trinity, how we honor God. And it's important for us to see the difference and to know the difference, be able to explain it. So what are these terms? The first one we're talking about is latria. It's a comes from a Greek word called latreia. And you Greek scholars out there can correct me if I was wrong in pronouncing that. It's a word that from what I've seen from researching it and from what I've been told that basically means service. Both these means both these words, latria, dulia, in their essence mean service. And at one point in time, like whenever the Greek was still used as like the ancient Greek was used as a common language, these kind of meant similar to almost the same thing. They were almost used interchangeably. But then St. Augustine, as he was writing, kind of takes these two words and gives them a specific meaning. And latria, the first word I'm going to talk about, is a word that he says should be used and should be the kind of service that should only be expressed to God. It is the, the word used for the adoration of God alone. We read in the scriptures about the Ten Commandments, and the first commandment that we know very well is that I, the Lord, am your God. I, the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image of any likeness of anything. These you shall not serve, and you shall not bow down to them. So I'm paraphrasing. I'm trying to read. It's a little difficult. Um, but the, what this basically means is he's saying, God is telling the people of Israel and is telling us, don't serve or bow down to other gods, obviously implying that I am the only God to whom you bow down to, to whom you worship, to whom you adore. And this is very important that we realize and we recommend, I mean, we know this, we know the Ten Commandments, we've heard them our entire life. But it's always good to go back and see that because even though we may know something in our heads, you know, we can sometimes forget it in our hearts. And this important thing that God points out to the people of Israel in this passage, it's not just about saying in your heart, like, God, you are the only God and I will serve you alone. It's about actually doing that service. It's not just about saying or thinking in your mind. It's about actually acting on it. It's by your actions not and by your thoughts and your desires are you putting God as the only God and that's important because when we look at some things that the catechism says about this adoration this honor that we give to God alone it'll use terms that evoke actions when people talk about this when theologians talk about this it denotes action like we do something to show that we honor God alone both by the way we live obviously. I mean, many of us see that, but also by the way we pray. The way that we pray when we approach God is different than the way we pray when we invoke the saints. Because when God is the only one, as we see when we read the Catechism, to whom we talk about adoration, we talk about worship. I think that's one of the essential and that things that makes our, the way we turn to God, different than the way we turn to saints, obviously. It's because God is the only one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity is the only one to whom we give worship. Worship means complete giving of ourselves over to God, complete obedience to God's will, and complete giving. You know, we talk about in the Mass, the one person, the focal point of the Mass, 
which is the supreme act of worship in the church, is God the Father. We, there's a f kind of formula that we use when we talk in liturgical theology for how the Mass kind of flows. It's directed to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the union of the Holy Spirit. You can hear this in the prayers even. The in ending of all the collects end basically through Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, so through Christ to God in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Everything is directed to God the Father through Christ and in the Holy Spirit. It is a prayer directed to only to God. Even when we celebrate feast days of saints and feast days of Mary, every Mass, when we celebrate them, we are celebrating them and honoring them, but we are not praying to them. We don't worship them. Our worship in the Mass is only directed to God. And in fact, that is when we talk about the kind of the purposes or the ends of the Mass, the final ends of the Mass, the first of those two ends are, is the glory of God, the second of which being our sanctification, the sanctification of the human race, which is only happens whenever we fully give ourselves in glory to God. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about adoration, when we talk about what we give to God. It is full, it is total, it's giving our whole selves, it's giving him worship and giving him command of ourselves. That is essentially what we do when we talk about latria. But then this other word, dulia. Dulia, which also is a Greek word, basically means service. And this is the word that we use when we talk about the veneration and the honor that we give to the saints. Those who have walked the path of life with the Lord have been made holy, have tried to image themselves off of Christ, and are now awaiting the resurrection in heaven. What do we give to the saints? What do we talk about when we talk about this dulia? Well, obviously, as I've made clear, we don't worship the saints. We don't give what we give to God to the saints. We, when we talk about the difference between latria and dulia, the theologians will always talk about it. It is a difference, not just of degree, as in just, it's not a lesser form of latria, but it's actually a different kind of thing. It is not even the same thing. The kind of service, so to speak, we give to the saints in Dulia is more along the lines of, like, an, like exactly that, honoring. We are lifting the saints up as those who have already gone before us and have achieved the goal that we all strive for, have achieved what we all hope for. And so, they are put up to us as examples to follow, as those to whom we look to in order to strive to imitate Christ on earth, as Christ has called us to. Not only that, but they're also there, and we honor them as powerful intercessors with God. In the book of Revelation, we read that the 24 elders, who are kind of like priestly figures, in the book of Revelation, in the vision of heaven, how they have these bowls of incense that they present before the throne of God. And the author of the book of Revelation, John, actually tells us that the incense is the prayers of the saints. And that can be taken in a couple ways. That can mean saints was sometimes used as a word to talk about the, the church on earth, the people of God on earth. The Saint, Saint Paul uses that all the time. But it can also be taken as the intercessory prayers that the saints make for us in heaven. And so the saints offer prayers to God in heaven. And we can say, well, why do we need to ask the saints for prayers? You know, can't we just pray directly to God? And while, yes, that is true that you can offer your prayers and ask for things from God, and that is obviously encouraged. It's an interesting way that we talk about um, the way that we're saved and the way that we achieve holiness is that, and I'll use kind of a paraphrased version of St. Augustine again, is that God can save us without us, and he did gain our salvation without us, but he chooses, he chooses, not, to, he chooses not to save us without us. I kind of 
messed it up there, but basically what he's trying to say is that God has the power. He, If he wanted to, he could just bring us all into resurrection and salvation. But he chooses instead, because of his love for us, to involve us in our salvation. In the same way he chooses to involve the saints in our quest for holiness and in our salvation. He chooses to allow the saints to be able to help to perfect our prayers in order to bring them to him, in order that they can be answered. He chooses to involve his creatures in salvation. And this is very important because it brings out one of the main differences, I think, in at least mainline Protestant thought, not obviously not all, but very various different schools of thought within Protestantism and Catholic theology, is that we don't believe that in like a zero-sum salvation, like God either does everything or man does everything. Like God either just snaps his fingers or God has, Jesus has died on the cross and then we're all saved no matter what we can do, or that we, man is completely the author of his own salvation. Like I have to do all these things. And like, we don't believe that, that we actually believe that God has saved us through Jesus Christ. God has won our salvation, but he calls us to participate in gaining that. He calls us to have a role in our own salvation, to cooperate with him. It's like a, he does everything and we also do something. It's a both and. And that's important to remember when we talk about the saints is that he involves the saints who are there standing in his presence, looking at him and gazing upon him and praying to him and worshiping him in heaven and also bringing our needs to him. That's why we pray to the saints because they are right now the closest to God because they're there with him in heaven. Their souls are with them in heaven and they are awaiting the resurrection. So they are in like the prime position to offer prayers for us, to per perfect our prayers and bring them before the throne of God. And so I think you can kind of see maybe the essential kind of difference between how we consider God and how we consider the saints is obviously we worship God, we give ourselves to God, and essentially the saints are given as models and as those to whom we, in, we in, can entrust ourselves to the saints in order that they can entrust us to God in a maybe a more perfect way. And this gets leads right into the final term I kind of use this hyperdulia, which dulia is the word we talked about before service, and hyper is just I think it's a Greek kind of suffix, a Greek word that's put on the front of words to mean kind of over. So it's like a greater form of the dulia service. And this is the word we use in theology when we talk about the reverence and veneration that we give to our Blessed Lady. And so the first thing we can see is that obviously dulia is in there. So it's the same kind of veneration maybe that we give to the saints, but the hyper gives it a greater degree, a greater kind of quantity, quality, whatever you want to call it. It makes it something higher. Mary we talk about as the saint above all saints. It's the greatest among the saints. And why is that? Well, obviously, it's because of her particular role within salvation history. In the Gospel of Luke, when the angel appears to Mary, he comes to her and refers to her and addresses her as the one, Hail, full of grace, which is actually in Greek, full of grace is like one, is one word which if i'm remembering my scripture studies well basically means and if you translate it literally it's like fully graced one or graced one like it's a it's a title almost it's a it's a word but it can kind of it kind of seems in the way it's it's used almost like a title and referring to mary because of her privileged place because of what god has done for her particularly that she has like this privileged role within salvation history. She is the mother of God. She is, in some ways, she's somewhat referred to as the co-redemptress, the co-mediatress. And why is that? Because 
through her, through her yes, through her obedience to God, through the way that she bore Christ and, you know, reared him and all this, all these things that she, in a very special way, because of God's plan, God's design, chose to involve her in salvation. And she is full of grace. And so when we talk about the veneration we give to Mary, it's like what we give to the saints, but higher. It's like what we give to the saints in the fact that she is a model for us to follow of humility, of lowliness, of purity, chastity, of all the virtues, of be living the Christ life, of suffering well with Christ. She's a model of virtue, a model of living life in Christ. As well, she is someone to intercede for us and the greatest intercessor before God for us, other than Christ Jesus himself, the mediator. She is the greatest intercessor because of her relationship and her closeness to God, especially because of the closeness to her son, Jesus Christ. And so she receives a special honor because of all those things. And she's given so many different titles, so many different ways to refer to her, so many different ways that we approach her because of who Christ was and because of how she was involved with everything that Christ was and Christ is. And that's an important thing to remember with this when we talk about how we venerate Mary and how we're going to talk about her in the coming month is that everything that we say that honors Mary, that everything, every way that we give glory to Mary is directly proportionate to some truth, some reality, some great honor that we have to give to Christ. It's a great, like she is like the, talk about like, you know, the sun and the moon. The moon is only as bright as the way that it reflects the light of the sun. In this very similar, same way, Mary is honored because of how she reflects her son, how she gives us an image of her son. And this is why there are so many different Marian dogmas that have come out in the church. Almost all the Marian statements that have been made, that both infallible dogmas and otherwise, are all said in order to give honor to Christ, in order to proclaim some truth about Christ. I think that's an important point to remember, and this is something that we, when you'll see whenever we, whenever the church undergoes different, looking at different, you know, revelations, different um, apparitions and such, one of the things she looks at and considers is how is this, is how is this revelation of Mary or what, what have you ref, reflecting back to Christ and to the Lord God? I think that's an important point because Mary does not point to anyone other than to Christ. Mary doesn't want, she wants us to honor her only in as much as that leads us to honor our son. Let's talk about with the, the consecration that's, promoted by St. Louis de Montfort, and that's so popular these days, it's not just a consecration to Mary, but it's a consecration to Jesus Christ through Mary. We entrust ourselves to Mary in order that she can increase our entrustment to Jesus, in order that, in order that she can help us to completely consecrate, commit, and trust ourselves to Jesus. It's always, always, always Everything that we say about Mary, everything that we pray to Mary, is always leading us to Christ. And that's what she wants. And that's an important thing to remember. And so that's why it's also important that we actually get to know Mary a little that we, a little more than maybe we do. That's why we pray to her, is because of the way that she can particularly lead us to Christ. Because she has a very particular um, relationship, obviously, because of her motherhood. And she's given to us as our mother in order that she can nurture us and make us into other Christs. That's her role. That's the role of the church is to make other Christs, to make all of us into that image of Christ. And so 
as we go along, as we go into the month of May, the important thing to look at and to meditate on is how is Mary calling us, each and all our own individual way, but also as a community to grow closer to Christ? Where, Whenever we pray to her, how is she leading us to Christ? And that's the important point to remember is... How is she leading you to Christ? And so as we move into the month of May, maybe that's something we can ponder and something we'll be diving into is the many different ways that we can get to know Our Lady better so that we can also get to know Our Lord better. And in this way, the more we grow to know Our Lady, the more we grow to know Our Lord Jesus Christ through her, then we can grow deeper in our love of Him through her. And so with that, in this session, I'm going to try to, I've got the screens flipped around, so I'm going to try to get set up here so I can listen to your questions. Um, so I want to just say, um, if you have any questions, please, you know, put them in the chat. Um, as I've mentioned, the month of May is the month of Mary month of Our Lady. And so we'll be diving deep into different Marian uh, themes in our posts and in the way that we, you know, talk about, you know, the, the different, uh, I am blinking right now. Hmm. Sorry. Let me do something real quick. There we go. All right. Whoop. I'm trying out new things and everything's falling apart. <laughs> That's all right, though. So now I can see the chat. I wasn't able to see it on my computer for some reason, but that's all right. So got it here. So as we, you know, kind of journey into this month of May, and I give you time, I'm going to give you some time to come up with questions, but I want to update you kind of where I'm at right now, but also give you some info on what to look forward to in these sessions in the coming month. So as you know, I took off last week um, from these video sessions. I spent a little time kind of in prayer, getting a little, um, getting just a little into trying to get in a little rhythm. And then I've been preparing for this month as we enter into the month of Mary to talk about different aspects of our theology, of our belief, of our faith in who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. And so as I mentioned, you know, the more we come to know Our Lady, the more we also come to know Our Lord. And everything that we say about Mary is directly tied to some truth that we believe about Jesus Christ. So what I want to do in the month of May and what I'm going to do is we have four weeks of videos during the month of May. And there are four Marian dogmas, Marian statements that have been, um, say like, infallibly taught. I think, let me, yeah, basically, I think, Four that have been infallibly taught. Four dogmas of Mary in our theology. Mary as the mother of God, or in Greek, the Theotokos. You may have heard that term before. Mary as immaculately conceived, the immaculate conception. The perpetual virginity of Mary. And the assumption of Mary. These are the four Marian dogmas. And so in order to get to know our Lady, a little better, we're going to take each one of these week by week and go through them and learn more about them because they'll reveal to us some insights about, you know, who Mary is and in turn, you know, who our Lord is. What do we say about our Lord? What does this have to reveal to us about, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ? And so that'll be the plan going into May. I hope you look forward to that. It's going to be Really awesome, I think. I've been digging up um, a lot of my old uh, notes from the seminary to try to to kind of plan this out. It'll be really good.
And then it'll be kind of, it may be a little deeper dive into theology than what I've been doing in some of these sessions, but I think you'll enjoy it. It'll really get us in the spirit of the month of May as we come to know Our Lady in, a, in an intellectual way, but also in a very deep spiritual way. So that's what you can look forward to. Also, as you know, as you've already heard, these sessions are going to start being on Tuesdays per Father Eric's update. Sorry, I need to get... Yes. And so, check this out every Tuesday. It'll be a real good time. Also, just kind of, I mentioned last week I was kind of off... Um, spend a little time in prayer. I'm doing pretty well, just as a per on a personal note. If you're wondering um, how things are going here, um, you know, trying to stay in a rhythm. Obviously, I miss all y'all out there, um, but it's been good to see some of y'all faces every now and then to talk with you, either via Facebook or text or anything. Um, know that we're working hard here. We're praying for you. Um, and as Father Eric said yesterday. Please, you know, let us know of the way that we can pray for you specifically. Um, give us, you know, if you have specific prayer intentions or, you know, if you want to be selfish. You can be selfish in this time and just ask for prayers for you specifically in a particular way. Then send us it either via, you know, via messaging on here or if you want to just like even... I don't remember the ways he said, but there are many different ways you can get in touch with us to just let us know how we can pray for you particularly. That's something that we want to we want to do intentionally. You know, every day we when we offer mass, both the one that is live streamed and the one that we say privately whenever we don't live stream our masses that we're praying for you in a very special way. And so if you would like us to pray for you in a specific way know that there are avenues that you can go about to let us know that to give us your prayer intentions and just let us know um what you need from us as far as prayer um and so as i see this doesn't look like there are any questions um give a little minute and Trying to think if there's anything else that I can update y'all on. Oh, I hope y'all all um, enjoyed this past weekend of the first live, um, for those of you who are sports fans, the first kind of live sports event we've had since March. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, you know, and it's something we can share with you all, not just sharing spiritually, like what, how we can pray for each other, sharing in the mass virtually sharing in prayers virtually sharing this virtually but you know every now and then um it's good to share just what we're watching how we're keeping busy how we're uh how we are enjoying this time um and i think that this past weekend with you know the nfl draft and with this documentary um that's been coming out on espn that was for me actually been a really good source of just good entertainment and good kind of breaking the the monotony and kind of getting a sense of normalcy again it was really awesome i hope for all of you who are sports fans that you enjoyed it as well um something that we can all kind of take a little bit of relief from i think okay well there are no questions it doesn't look like there are any I will leave you for this week. Um, look forward to the coming weeks. And uh, I hope through the intercession of Mary and all the saints that God would bless you in this time. And I hope that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. So from all of us here at St. Genevieve, God bless y'all and see y'all later.